Hi, my name is Kim McKnight, and I'm the program manager for the Historic Preservation and Heritage Tourism Program at the Parks and Recreation Department. I'm pleased to be the moderator for session four today, which is understanding our ancestors through anthropology. The multifaceted field of anthropology provides valuable insights into the lives of African American ancestors. Genetic anthropologists from the University of Connecticut will discuss the study of ancient DNA in important projects in Texas and in Georgia. Physical anthropologists from New South Associates will discuss how the science of physical and mortuary anthropology, coupled with geophysical techniques, search and rescue dogs, and exploratory trenching led to the discovery of more than 100 burials in Georgia. Let me introduce our speakers. Dr. Deborah Bolnick is an anthropological geneticist and biological anthropologist who explores how socio-political forces, historical events, and social inequities shape human genomic and epigenomic diversity, as well as human biology more broadly. In her research, Dr. Bolnick analyzes DNA from ancient and contemporary peoples in conjunction with other lines of evidence to help reconstruct population histories in the Americas. She received her PhD in anthropology from the University of California at Davis and is a past president of the American Association of Anthropological Genetics. She is also the co-author of Reflections of Our Past, How Human History is Revealed in Our Genes, and is a co-organizer of the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples and Genomics program. Samantha Archer is a third year PhD student at the University of Connecticut in the Departments of Anthropology and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. A Houston native, she graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a bachelor's in anthropology, women's and gender studies and religious studies in 2014 and a master's in anthropology in 2018. Her areas of academic interest and expertise are biocultural theory, ancient DNA, historical American archaeology and science and technology studies. Her dissertation will focus on the analyses of ancient DNA from the individuals at Oakwood Cemetery, as well as the individuals from the Bullhead Camp Cemetery in Fort Bend County, Texas, also known as the Sugarland 95. Dr. J.W. Joseph is a registered professional archaeologist who received his Master's of Arts in American Civilization and PhD in Historical Archaeology from the University of Pennsylvania. In his 44 years of professional experience, Dr. Joseph's work has emphasized exploring the African American past and making archaeological findings accessible and relevant to the descendant community and the public. Dr. Joseph has worked on multiple cemetery projects and is particularly engaged with the issue of unmarked burial grounds and their recognition and protection. As president for the Society of Historical Archaeology from 2016 to 2018, Dr. Joseph led efforts to successfully develop and pass with bipartisan support the African American Burial Grounds Network Bill, which creates a voluntary nationwide database of historic burial grounds to provide technical assistance for partners to research, survey, identify, record, preserve, evaluate, and interpret these sites. The bill will also enable grants to be offered for preservation and education activities for communities to learn about these historic sites. Dr. Matt Maternus is a mortuary archaeologist and physical anthropologist working for New South Associates, an archaeology and historic preservation firm in Stone Mountain, Georgia. He grew up in North Carolina, where he first got interested in cemeteries from the local Moravian communities. He is a graduate of UNC Greensboro and holds a master and doctoral degrees from the University of Tennessee. He has 36 years of experience in that, uh, examining cemeteries, with the last 20 based in Georgia. He has authored or co-authored 26 papers and over 200 research projects, all addressing historic or prehistoric burial grounds. His current research interests focus on historic period cemeteries, with a particular interest in folk traditions, upland and lowland funerary practices. The session will begin with a uh, longer presentation from De Dr. Deborah Bolnick, followed by the others, and then followed by question and answer. Enjoy. I want to begin today by thanking the Austin Parks and Recreation Department for inviting us to participate in this symposium. I'm delighted to have, we have the opportunity to share some of the work our research group is doing and would like to take the next few minutes to provide some background on what genetic studies will be able to tell us about the individuals who were buried in Oakwood Cemetery and the lives they lived. This work I want to note is being undertaken in collaboration with the individuals shown here. Samantha Archer, a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Connecticut, who will speak next. 
Lauren Springs, a PhD student in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin, and Dr. Maria Franklin, a professor of archaeology at UT Austin. I want to note that while Sam and I are now based in Connecticut, we were both longtime residents of Austin before moving to Yukon two years ago. It's therefore a privilege and an honor to be able to contribute to this project in a community that we both miss. So Sam, Lauren, and I are all anthropological geneticists with expertise in the analysis of ancient DNA. And we're especially interested in the ways that DNA from individuals who lived in the past can help us learn more about who they were, what their lives were like, and more broadly, about the histories of the communities in which they lived. As anthropologists, we do not look at DNA in isolation, but rather consider the DNA in conjunction with other biological, archeological, genealogical, archival, and ethnographic evidence. Our central focus, though, is the DNA. DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, is a molecule shaped like a double helix that's found inside all of the cells in our body. Most of our DNA is found inside the nucleus of the cell, highlighted here, although there is also a little bit found in organelles called mitochondria, which are located outside the cell nucleus. The nucleus of the cell contains your chromosomes, and each chromosome is made up of tightly wound DNA, as shown here. The DNA itself is a string of four types of molecules, which are often represented by the letters A, T, C, and G. Most of the sequence of letters is identical in all humans, but there are some spots where the letters differ in different people. For example, one individual may show a C, where another individual may show a T at a particular point in that DNA sequence or series of letters. These spots are referred to colloquially as genetic markers because they mark places in the DNA sequence that differentiate different people. Scientists also call them single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs for short. Because related individuals usually inherit the same genetic markers from a common ancestor, DNA analysis can be used to identify closely related individuals or groups of people. Furthermore, because some genetic markers or SNPs are more common in some parts of the world than others, these analyses can shed some light on the likely geographic origin of the lineage in question. In general, there are three different types of DNA that we can analyze to help us infer ancestry and relatedness. First, there is mitochondrial DNA, which is a small circular piece of DNA found in the mitochondria of the cell. It comprises less than 1% of your DNA and is inherited solely from your mother. So this kind of DNA comes from only one ancestor in every generation. Mitochondrial DNA tests can therefore be used to trace maternal lineages. Second, the Y chromosome is one of the 46 chromosomes located in the cell nucleus and is generally found in men, not women. Individuals with two X chromosomes usually identify as female, whereas individuals with one X and one Y chromosome usually identify as male. The Y chromosome comprises about 2% of your DNA and is inherited through the paternal line. In other words, it's passed down typically from father to son. It can therefore be used to trace paternal lineages. Like with the mitochondrial DNA, the simple mode of inheritance makes it comparatively easy to trace ancestry using this kind of DNA to see who shares a maternal or paternal ancestor at some point in the past. Genetic comparisons of the mitochondrial DNA or Y chromosome DNA from different people can therefore be used to identify relatives on the direct maternal or paternal line and to, confer to confirm suspected ancestor descendant relationships. For example, such as a relationship potentially that might exist between two individuals with the same surname. And third, we can examine genetic markers in the autosomal DNA, or DNA in the cell nucleus that's inherited from both parents. Because this DNA comes from both parents, all four grandparents, all eight great-grandparents, and so on, it can provide a broader picture of a person's genetic makeup and ancestry. 
So as you can see in this figure, the son and daughter at the very bottom here, each exhibit their circular mitochondrial DNA from their mother. The son inherits his Y chromosome from his father and his father's father and his father's father's father before him. But their autosomal DNA represented by these bars or chromosomes here are made up of many different colors indicating that it's been inherited from all of these different great grandparents. So if individuals share large sections of DNA in common, it is indicative of a close biological relationship and the degree of genetic sharing can help us ascertain what that relationship might have been. So for example, if two individuals buried at Oakwood Cemetery share about 50% of their DNA, that would tell us that we have identified either a parent and child or a pair of siblings. Or if someone alive today thinks that their great-great-great-grandmother was buried here, and we find that a woman interred in the cemetery shares about 6.25% of their DNA with this person, it would suggest that this very well may have been their great-great-grandmother. More broadly, because some genetic markers or SNPs are more common in some parts of the world than others, genetic comparisons involving mitochondrial DNA, Y chromosome DNA, and autosomal DNA can also help us infer where around the world a person has genetic relatives, and by extension, where their ancestors may have lived in the past. For example, if an individual's mitochondrial DNA exhibits the genetic markers that place it in a lineage known as L1C, comparisons with mitochondrial DNA from people living around the world would show us that this lineage is most prevalent today in the shaded regions shown on the map here. The darker the shading, the more this genetic lineage is found in each region. This tells us then that this genetic lineage is most common today in West Central Africa, and thus the individual that we're studying has genetic relatives in that region. That may also be where this person's ancestors came from, but I want to note that this kind of inference is less certain because people moved around in the past just as they do today, and our ancestors may not have lived where their descendants do today or they may not have identified as well as a member of the same communities or social groups, since those affiliations can change through time too. Nevertheless, these kinds of comparisons can still offer some important insights into where genetic relatives live and where a person's ancestors may have come from. These analyses can therefore tell us a lot about people who lived in the past. For example, as part of another project we've been involved with, we've analyzed the maternally inherited mitochondrial DNA from a group of individuals had been, who had been buried in an unmarked and largely forgotten part of an early 19th century cemetery in Athens, Georgia. Their graves were disturbed by a construction project on the University of Georgia campus, and DNA analysis was undertaken with community support to learn more about the identities of these individuals. We found that almost all of the individuals that were studied exhibited genetic lineages that are prevalent in West Africa, suggesting that their maternal ancestors had come from there. This was not a surprise to many members of the local African American community, who had suspected from the start that these forgotten graves were where enslaved members of the Athens community had been laid to rest two centuries ago. In addition to clarifying a person's genetic ancestry and their relationships with others buried nearby or alive today, DNA studies can also shed light on other aspects of these individuals' identities and their lives. For example, by determining if an individual exhibits X and Y chromosomes, or just X chromosomes, we can assess their genetic sex, where an individual who has two X chromosomes is typically seen as genetically female, and one who has an X and Y chromosome is genetically male. While genetic sex does not always align with the gender that a person holds in life, this information nevertheless contributes to our knowledge of that person. We can also look for non-human DNA in the bodies of those who've lived in the past in order to gain some insight into their diets and experiences with disease. For example, if an individual's teeth have dental calculus or hardened tooth plaque on the surface, it may be possible to extract plant and animal DNA from that dental calculus, which would have been deposited by the foods they were eating. 
This kind of genetic analysis can therefore shed light on their diets during life. For example, in other studies, such as this one of people living in 18th and 19th century England, researchers have been able to determine that the individuals had consumed a variety of cereals or grains, edible plants, and dairy products. Furthermore, if the DNA extracted from a person's remains includes pathogen DNA, such as DNA from the parasite that causes malarial infections, or DNA from the bacteria that causes tuberculosis, or DNA from the viruses that cause, say, influenza or measles, it would offer some insight into the diseases that this individual experienced during their life. For example, in this study of the victims of a, of a 16th century epidemic in Mexico, researchers found DNA from salmonella bacteria, suggesting that this bacteria may have contributed to their deaths. And finally, an analysis of certain chemical markers that become attached to a person's DNA over the course of their lifetime can help illuminate some of what that person experienced during life. The presence or absence of these chemical or epigenetic marks on certain genes in the DNA can provide information about the environmental factors that a person was exposed to. For example, when a methyl group gets added to a cytosine or C, one of the four nucleotide letters in the DNA, that cytosine becomes methylated, which can affect how the gene is expressed in a person's body. The presence or absence of cytosine methylation can suggest if a person experienced a high level of trauma or stress during their life, for example, or malnutrition, and how such experiences may have become embodied. Our lab group has been involved in pioneering methods for studying methylation in ancient DNA, and we look forward to applying these approaches to learn more about the lives of the individuals buried under the Oakwood Cemetery Chapel. And lastly, I just want to note that the study of ancient DNA can be quite challenging, as most of the DNA in a person's body breaks down after their death. Ancient DNA samples typically contain only 1 to 5% of the DNA that we, that we would see in a sample from a living individual. And what has survived is usually broken down into very short strings of nucleotides or letters. Because so little ancient DNA is present, it can be difficult to study and is subject to contamination, where DNA from external sources, such as those handling the samples, could accidentally be sequenced instead, confounding our results. Ancient DNA research is therefore quite sensitive and requires laboratory methods and facilities that have been designed specifically for the study of ancient DNA. It also requires great care because we are working with the remains of people who deserve our deepest respect. Our lab at the University of Connecticut specializes in this type of analysis. We work in a restricted access, state-of-the-art clean lab that was designed and built just last year for the study of human ancient DNA. We use only non-destructive or minimally destructive methods and employ protocols at all stages of the process that were designed specifically for the study of degraded ancient DNA. We also employ extensive procedures to exclude contamination from external DNA and detect any contamination that does occur to ensure that it will not affect the findings of our research. I'll stop here, but first want to thank the many colleagues and community partners with whom we work, as well as the various institutions and agencies that have provided funding for our research. Thank you. Okay, hi everyone. The working title for my dissertation research is Investigating the Genetic Effects of State-Sanctioned Violence in 19th Century Texas. I'm going to begin my presentation by giving a brief overview of 19th century Texas history. The history of Texas and the history of plantation slavery in Texas are inextricable from one another. Members of the group known as the Old 300, or the group of Anglo-American men handpicked by Stephen F. Austin to colonize the Northeast state of Mexico, began to arrive in what we now know as Texas in 1821. With them, they brought approximately 500 enslaved African Americans over the course of three to four years. In 1836, Texas declared its independence from Mexico and became the Republic of Texas, 
it is still debated amongst Texas historians as to whether slavery was an impetus for the Texas Revolution, as Mexico had declared slavery illegal in 1829. Houston is then incorporated in 1837 at the intersection of the Buffalo and White Oak Bayous. The land immediately proximal to the Brazos River and just southwest of Houston, also known as Fort Bend County, is also incorporated in 1837, but had been used from the very beginning of American colonization in Texas for plantation economies. Austin is incorporated in the last days of 1839, and with it, what was known at the time as City Cemetery is established as Austin's first cemetery. This is what we now know as Oakwood Cemetery today. In the waning days of 1845, Texas gains statehood and becomes the 28th state admitted to the Union. Near exactly 15 years later, Texas secedes from the Union in 1861 and joins the Confederacy in March of that year. On January 1st, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation is signed by President Abraham Lincoln. And on June 19th, 1865, Union General Gordon Granger lands in Galveston and Black Texans are finally informed of their freedom two and a half years after African Americans in other parts of the country had been living free lives. This is the holiday known as Juneteenth. From the beginning of American colonization in Texas in late 1821 to statehood in 1845, 25,000 enslaved African Americans were brought to Texas. In the days immediately before the Civil War, there were 182,000 enslaved African Americans in Texas, and by Juneteenth, there were a quarter of a million due to the rapid influx towards the end of the Civil War. In the waning days of the Civil War, slave owners from other parts of the country retreated to Texas with their bondsmen, partially in hopes that Texas would return to being its own country instead of rejoining the Union and would keep slavery legal. Clearly, this is not what, what ultimately happened, but this is the reason we see a significant spike in the Black population in Texas by the time Juneteenth occurs. Black Texans had heterogeneous experiences of post-emancipation -emanci life in the late 19th century, with many transitioning to sharecropping, some establishing freedmen communities, and a few actually achieving the dream many had, ownership of land. By the turn of the 20th century, nearly 30% of Black Texans owned land. However, another fate loomed in the not-so-far future for hundreds of emancipated Black Texans, the rise of the Texas penal system. Convict leasing is not original to Texas or, or to the South. Massachusetts was, lease, was leasing out convicts as early as 1798. California and several Northeastern states adopted and abandoned the practice at various times in the mid 19th century. Conceptually, prisons have existed in the United States since the colonial era. In the early 19th century, it was seen as pertinent for a state to have at least one penitentiary so that they, so that they might send their delinquent citizens to prison to be rehabilitated. Texas was one of the later adopters of this attitude, but eventually began building its first prison, the Huntsville State Prison, in 1848 and accepted its first inmate in 1849. Texas rejoined the Union after the Civil War in 1865 with 165 prisoners. In 1871, Texas entered into its first convict leasing contract and over the course of over 40 years would lease out humans to labor in ways that were either no discernibly different from antebellum plantation slavery or in some cases worse. Many Texans do not know that the Capitol building that stands no more than a mile away from the Oakwood Cemetery was built with convict labor over the course of several years until it opened its doors in 1888. Convict leasing was officially abolished statewide in 1914, but it ended in practice two years earlier in 1912. It feels pertinent to note that 1914 is the year the Oakwood Chapel was built. While we have no indication that the individuals buried in Oakwood Cemetery had anything to do with convict leasing, I highlight these facts to demonstrate how interwoven this so-called hidden history is. And finally, I end this timeline in 1928, the year Black Austinites were formally segregated to East Austin with the city's quote-unquote master plan. 100 years later, their grandchildren and great-grandchildren would find themselves pushed to the outskirts of the city as Austin grew in population while simultaneously declining in its overall Black population.
There was a time in the late 19th century that Austin was home to over a dozen freedmen communities. And today these communities are mostly only known in name, if at all. Texas's general prison population grew from one inmate in the year 1849 to dipping just below 4,000 by 1912. African Americans have always been overrepresented in the Texas prison system. As the white population of the state grew into the millions by the turn of the century, Black Texans were still imprisoned at significantly higher rates, even though their population growth wasn't anywhere near the exponential boom white Texans were experiencing. Here, you see that in 1880, there were about 1,200 Black inmates and about 750 white inmates. By 1912, there were just over 2,000 Black inmates to the 1,000 white. In 1870, there were a quarter of a million African Americans in Texas, while whites were rounding out near 600,000. By 1910, there were 700,000 Black folks in the state to the 3.2 million whites. All right, so turning to this question, what can we hope to learn from ancient DNA analyses of the Sugarland 95 and the individuals interred at Oakwood Cemetery? And how does this relate to the study of state sanctioned violence in 19th century Texas? First, genomic ancestry. Through next generation sequencing, we hope to gain a better understanding of these individuals' genomic and broader geographic ancestry. This does not correlate to race, but one can make an educated inference based on an individual's genetic ancestry as to how they would have been racialized during the time periods in which they lived. Because of various rules, like the one drop rule, for example, individuals who exhibited any kind of African ancestry would have likely been considered black and therefore anyone who has West, Eastern, and or Sub-Saharan African ancestry in the Sugarland 95 and Oakwood Cemetery populations would have more than likely been racialized as Black in 19th century Texas. We will also be able to use this data to infer relatedness between individuals in the bur burial populations or identify their living descendants, which I will discuss in just a moment. Genetic sexing. We hope to identify either the presence or lack of the Y chromosome in each individual, which will either complement or complicate the forensic assessments of gender. This will give us a better understanding of the gender dynamics of both the Sugarland 95, convict leasing, and the individuals at Oakwood Cemetery. Experience with disease. Based on patterns of disease in Texas in the mid-19th century and based on death records for the Sugarland 95, we might be able to gain a better understanding of these individuals' experiences with disease. Nine individuals in the Sugarland 95 died of malaria, for example, and it may be possible to identify the genomic information of plasmodial parasites or the parasites responsible for human malarial infections in these individuals. Diet. Through the study of dental calculus or hardened tooth plaque, we may be able to identify the genomic information of a variety of plants and animals that might have been common in these individuals' diet. Staples of Texas inmates' diet, as reported in the Sugarland 95 report, include beans, rice, greens, potatoes, bacon, pumpkin, and coffee. The dental calculus could also be of help in the identification of pathogenic DNA. Epigenetics. Through the study of human epigenetics, several genes have been identified as important for an individual's stress regulation and reactivity. Given decent preservation, we may be able to test several hypotheses related to the epigenetic correlates of stress induced by the myriad of unfathomable conditions experienced by these individuals at the hands of racist state-sanctioned violence. For example, a total of 39 individuals between the Sugarland 95 and the individuals at Oakwood Cemetery display indications of skeletal trauma. Skeletal trauma has been used as a proxy for differential methylation in ancient DNA studies previously. And finally, it may be possible to identify some of these individuals' living descendants. To demonstrate what this might look like in terms of a family tree, I used a standard of 20 years for a new generation to begin. Therefore, given that many of these individuals were born on average around 1860, 
their sixth or seventh generation descendants would be alive today. This timeline demonstrates the scope of potential dates of death of every individual between both the Sugarland 95 and Oakwood individuals. Nearly all of the Sugarland 95 individuals have actual recorded dates of death, but we do not have such precise data for the Oakwood individuals. The Oakwood archaeological team used material items found with the burials to provide an approximate date, but the approximations still span several decades in most cases. Most of the Sugarland individuals passed away in the late 19th century or very early 20th century. It is more likely that the Oakwood individuals died a little earlier, but certainly all before 1914. Therefore, we can infer that the individuals buried at Oakwood were born in the mid early to mid 19th century, and if they were Black, were more than likely born into slavery and experienced it in adulthood. They likely were not born in Texas, but very likely could have lived out a portion of their lives there. The Sugar Lane 95 were born closer to the middle and towards the end of the 19th century, and many of them were actually born in Texas, and several others were born in other southern states, such as Alabama and Georgia. Many of them were born into slavery and experienced slavery in childhood and adulthood, and many others were born during the Civil War or just after and did not experience slavery outright. In conclusion, the lived experiences of these individuals and what we might know about them and their lives through genomic information are of vast importance on a multitude of levels, including understanding the repercussions of forced penal labor and the consequences of racist state-sanctioned violence. Learning about these individuals and attending to their memory with care is the main impetus behind my research. Please look into the books and podcasts I've cited here to learn more about the history of 19th century Black Texans. Thank you for listening. This all started with a casual question. A historian interviewing a local informant about a standing structure within the construction area of what was then known as Avondale Mill Road was asked if the Georgia Department of Transportation knew about an old cemetery in the overgrown corner of a field there was nothing on the surface, no records of it on any maps, and only a few of the local lifetime residents were dimly aware of it. Unfortunately, the proposed road construction project could not avoid the cemetery's location, and relocation was identified as the most appropriate course of action. This set us on an investigation that uncovered a forgotten, unrecorded community that had vanished from the local landscape and reconnected modern families with their long lost roots. Slide. New South Associates was approached by the Georgia Department of Transportation to investigate and recover not only the remains of what became known as the Avondale Burial Place, but to learn who these people were and their place in history. The Avondale Burial Place is located in Bibb County, just south of Macon, Georgia. Within an area of about a tenth acre in size, the Georgia Transportation, Department of Transportation, and New South Associates identified over a hundred graves, each with a unique individual and each the record of a unique life. Slide. This is the aerial view from 1938. It's the closest image we've been able to find of the cemetery. It occupies this undeveloped corner where four land lots and four agricultural fields came together. There were no records of Avondale. The cemetery was not part of a churchyard. It was not recorded on any maps, and there are no recognizable markers or decorations present. The grounds were avoided and accessible only by an old farm road from the north, which had long since been abandoned by the time of our investigation. Slide. This is how the cemetery looked when we found it. The cemetery was located on a slight rise adjacent to a wetland and in close proximity to Echicone Creek. Since local farmers avoided plowing this corner, the forest had reclaimed it. Southern rural cemeteries often occupy higher ground by pla and placing the dead a little closer to heaven. And by following African traditions, placement near water helped to separate the worlds of the living and the dead. Slide. 
We initially examined the ground surface for indications like depressions, markers, fences, and borders, but we didn't find any. We did find tiny bits of glass and pottery, which were scattered so that when light hit them, their shimmer provided the spirit with a path to the world of the dead. Brick and marker, fragment, marker fragments were also identified, but could not be traced to a particular grave. So how do you find a cemetery when there are practically no markers? Slide. We tried probing, that is, looking for grave shaft soils, which are softer, and contrasted these against the harder, undisturbed subsoils. However, surface deposits had been disturbed, rendering probing ineffective. Slide. We had more luck with the use of cadaver dogs. These animals can detect molecular compounds associated with decomposition in the range of a few parts per million and are an important aid in helping us find lost cemeteries. 54% of the spots identified by the cadaver dogs turned out to be graves. Slide. We also use ground penetrating radar, which transmits pulses of radar energy into the ground and measures the velocity of reflected signals. These data were then translated into horizontal slices representing common depths. Slide. Areas with significant shifts in signal amplitude are represented here in green and orange. About half of these turned out to be graves. Now, finding graves in Georgia's red clay is notoriously difficult, and there is no single method that identifies every grave. But by pooling the surface data, we were able to approximate the size and the area of the cemetery. Slide. In order to ensure that all graves were recovered, we removed the top two feet of disturbed soil, hand scraped the surface with shovels to expose these rectangular grave shafts that could be seen in the subsoil. We exposed a 30 foot wide grave free space around the entire cemetery to ensure that everybody was identified. Slide. Once graves had been identified, we carefully uncovered and recorded their contents. Graves contain a lot of information, so copious notes, maps, and photographs were taken to document what we observed. Slide. This is what we found. There are 101 individual graves. 61 contained subadults, and the remaining 40 were adults of which 16 males and 10 females could be defined. Child mortality was high, and skeletal features indicated that malnutrition, violence, chronic infections, and hard labor adversely impacted the community. In sum, the lack of skeletal health responses implied death from communicable ailments, including malaria, typhoid fever, and yellow fever which are known to be endemic in, De in Bibb County. Tuberculosis also accounted for 15% of all African-American deaths in the area. To counter these maladies, the community employed a blend of traditional African, Anglo-American, Anglo and newly developed African-American beliefs and life ways. Charms, including pierced silver coins, beads, and this moon and star pendant, provided supernatural protection to the deceased. While death, oh, sorry, slide. When death came, decedents were placed in simple coffins or caskets that were adorned with hardware likely obtained from local general stores. They were then placed in plank-covered two-stage grave pits. Slide. Following West African traditions, Personal possessions were sometimes included to keep the spirit from wandering. Objects including tobacco pipes, wedding bands, and medicine bottles were found. Perhaps the most poignant of these was this porcelain doll found tucked under a child's arm. If ever an object was needed in the next world, it would have clearly been this doll. Slide. And the light blue were deposited between 1840 and 1900. They formed the core of the cemetery. Graves deposited after about 1870 were located along the periphery 
emphasizing outward expansion until the cemetery was abandoned in the 1920s. Graves in the central core could easily include enslaved decedents, and some graves appear to be placed in clusters or family groups. Our guess is that more than one family is present. Slide. We don't know exactly who these families were, but we do have some clues. Prior to the Civil War, African Americans in Bibb County were enslaved, with those closest to the cemetery being part of the MacArthur estate, dating perhaps as early as the 1820s. John MacArthur's 1846 will listed 13 individuals whom modern descendants can trace their lineage. And by retracing the census taker's route, we were able to identify a number of the families living close to the cemetery. Now, technically, the cemetery was adjacent to, but not on the MacArthur estate. Prior to accepting that the cemetery contained their ancestors, African-American descendants of the MacArthur estate wished to verify this connection. Maternal lineages are best understood from the MacArthur estate. So mitochondrial DNA, which has passed down the female lines, was used to help identify relatedness. 20 tooth and bone samples were submitted to the University of Oklahoma Laboratory of Molecular Anthropology. Results indicate that two distinct African-American haplotypes, L and U, were present, confirming that these folks were, Af were of African ancestry. The H2 haplotype was also consistent with African-American lineages. Slide. Eight potential living descendants were also tested. Living subject three matched features 31 and 33 from Avondale, and living subjects seven and 10 matched feature one. These results confirmed that there were genetic links between Avondale and the descendant community. With descendants embracing the cemetery, bonds to the past were renewed. Avondale was no longer a forgotten place. Lives have once again been remembered, and a bit of their world has been revealed. The remains from Avondale were reinterred in nearby Bethel A.M.E. Church Cemetery, among whose congregation there are many ties that extend back into the anti local antebellum era. Slide. The legacies of Avondale, including copies of our final report, are documented on the internet at the website listed here. The Georgia Department of Transportation also generated a documentary entitled I Remember, I Believe, which can be found on YouTube. It's a fascinating trip, and if you have the time, I hope that you could watch the film and enjoy the website. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Um, my name is Kim McKnight, and I'm thrilled to um, sort of wrap up this session with a few questions for our panelists. I did some intros at the beginning, but I just want to um, kind of remind everybody, we first heard from Dr. Deborah Bolnick, who talked about um, some of the great work she's done on testing ancient DNA. Um, we then heard from Samantha Arthur, uh, Archer, who is a graduate student at the University of Connecticut with Dr. Bolnick, and she is working on her dissertation and will focus on the burials at Oakwood as well as the burials at Sugarland 95, which she highlighted. We're also thrilled to have Dr. Joseph and Dr. Maternus from New South Associates. Uh, Dr. Maternus narrated the last video presentation, but both are representatives of the firm. So this is pretty exciting to have this kind of science um, introduced to um, our symposium, and it's um, a session that we're all quite excited about. So thank you very much. Uh, I also just want to add, if you have a minute to, to watch the video that uh, Dr. Maternus mentioned, uh, we did play it during our dinner break. It's really quite fantastic. So I have a few questions, and I know Laura will jump in with some questions of her, uh, from, from the um, participants um, when, when they come through. Um, I, you know, what struck me most was the importance of working with descendant communities within all of your presentations. So um, if you could, maybe I could hear from all of you about how, how, why is that important and how does it inform the projects that you've worked on? Um, maybe we'll start with Dr. Bolnick since um, you went first in your presentation. 
Yeah, I think work, working with descendant communities in these contexts is critically important because these are the communities that are most invested and interested in these studies. And it's important to have conversations so that the research can be sure to address questions that are of interest to descendant communities and stakeholder communities and to get the insights from community members about the history that I know from, from past experience and in other contexts, we find that community members are often very familiar with relevant history that as a geneticist, I may not know. And that can be critically important for us to interpret the genetic data correctly and to come to our best insights. So really it, bringing information to the table that science alone cannot really bring to the table. Sam, yes. how about you? Anything you'd like to add? Yeah, absolutely. Like just going off of that. Um, so for example, like descendant communities have oral histories that we wouldn't necessarily know that information from studying um, the remains of these individuals, from studying the cemetery context, from looking at the historical archeology. span like these, the history of these people are passed down from generation to generation and can give us an idea of where to look, where we might have not looked before. Um, and additionally, descendant communities can help us shape hypotheses. They can give us clues as to where to look and they can collaborate with us um, to just make a better science, right? Like the science is only improved when the descendant communities are involved. Um, it's not objective versus subjective knowledge. It's really adding everybody's perspective into the project. Um, and additionally, we've already seen a lot of these issues come up with the African Burial Ground Project. Um, we've seen descendant communities not engaged with, and then we've seen what happens when they are engaged with, and some really critical knowledge came out of that project. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's absolutely critical. Dr. Joseph, can you speak to, you know, your thoughts on the importance of, of the interfacing with the descendant community? So, so in Avondale, actually identifying the descendant community was a tremendous challenge. We had no marked burials. Uh, when we first started doing, doing genealogy, I thought it was an impossible task. How are we supposed to be able to trace who's buried in this cemetery? Uh, but fortunately, through genealogical websites and through tracing the family names associated with the area, we were able to connect with the descendants of Helen Barton and Hardy Thomas, who were two enslaved African-American women on the MacArthur Plantation, and were able to link up with Skip Mason. We actually had a gathering of the Barton Thomas uh, descendants uh, who came and visited the excavations on Memorial Day in 2010, while, the, while work was in progress. And as Matt mentioned, provided DNA samples, which we were then able to prove that they were indeed connected to the Avondale Prairie Place. So in this case, they're not providing us information about the cemetery because they didn't know where it was, but through archeology, span we were able to connect them to a place from their past and sort of give, give them a sense of bearing of, of, of what their ancestors' lives were like in that part of Georgia. Amazing. Dr. Maternus, anything you want to add? In talking with the descendants from Avondale, one of the things that we approached them with was, what are the types of questions that you would like to see us answer from our examination in the cemetery? Our original plan really did not include doing any DNA analysis. Uh, it's a destructive technique, and most of the, most groups we've worked with are very apprehensive about doing any type of destructive analysis. But they came to us and said, we really would like to be able to verify that these are our ancestors. Can you do DNA analysis? And what, once we were sure that they were aware that this involved uh, destructive types of techniques, we approached and we ran with the information to see what we got out of it. And as it turned out, it worked extremely well. For us, we were able to absolutely verify that, yep, these were their folks. It's incredible. It's really incredible. Uh, something that we're pretty excited about is um, 
you know, this partnership that we have formed with the University of Connecticut to perform DNA testing on the individuals at Oakwood Cemetery. And one of the things that really swayed us was the techniques and methodologies that that um, university has pioneered to try to use um, uh, minimally destructive to non-destructive techniques. I do want to say to our community that we are still working out the details about how to connect um, interested Austin citizens with the University of Connecticut so that they, they will be able to submit samples of saliva. And so please know that that information will be forthcoming. Um, let me just put a question out to Dr. Bolnick and, and, and Sam Archer about what do you think the DNA analysis could potentially tell us about the individuals at Oakwood that maybe the, um, we learned a lot of really great information to date through the, to, through the artifacts and through the archaeology and bioarchaeology. What additional insight can DNA analysis bring? Yeah, so um, I anticipated this question and I took no. <laughs> um, so there are several prominent African-American historical cemeteries in Texas that have been excavated. Um, a few of them have been talked about in the mm -hmm. symposium already. So we have the Freedmen Cemetery in Dallas. Um, there's the Pioneer Cemetery in Brazoria. Um, there's also the Montgomery Hill Cemetery in Navarro. And there's also the Allen Parkway Village, which is um, in the fourth ward of Houston, my hometown. Um, and those excavations have given us incredible insight into the life ways of Black Texans um, before the Civil War and after the Civil War. But what's unique about offering a genomic analysis is that we can learn um, a significant amount more about the genetic dynamics, not only of ancestry and genetic sexing, like I mentioned in my talk, but also we can actually look at lived experience. We can confirm potentially um, what diseases these individuals had experience with. We could potentially look at what, um, what their diet was. We could potentially look at how the stressors that they lived through um, because of penal labor, because of state sanctioned violence, how that is actually um, marked on their DNA. Those are all potentials. It's not a guarantee because it's all based on how well preserved the DNA is, but we're hopeful because um, these burials come from a relatively, um, because these burials are relatively young in terms of ancient DNA, we're hopeful that the DNA will be well preserved so that we might be able to actually look into some of the answers to these questions. Um, and then additionally, Maria Franklin, who spoke earlier, just recently came out with a publication about the health of um, African Americans in the South in the late 19th and early 20th century in post in post emancipation South. And these studies could potentially add to some of the things that she looked at she um, and her co author Sam Wilson did comparative studies of several cemeteries across the South and looked at um, hypotheses like the urban penalty, where um, it's been hypothesized that individuals died earlier because they were living in urban centers rather than in rural areas. And so we might be able to test those kinds of hypotheses with the data combined from both Oakwood and the Sugar Land 95. That's incredible. Anyone have anything else to add, and uh, Dr. Bolnick or Dr. Joseph or Maternus, about what the DNA analysis could potentially bring? We we don't ha we haven't identified people who are clearly descendant community uh, members yet. Maybe I'll just add that I think I mean because of the COVID pandemic, it's been difficult to date to have many conversations or have conversations for, as geneticists with community members and, and stakeholders. And this is something that we're hopeful will be able to happen in the not too distant future. Mm -hmm. And I think will be very helpful in helping to guide some of this genetic analysis. And I think more broadly, just to add to what Sam said is that I think this work is really important because I mean, anthropology as a discipline has been deeply intertwined with the racism that's played out in science and in this country in many ways. And the histories of these communities have 
been quite neglected and not as well studied as they should have been by many members of this community. There certainly are some scholars, especially um, scholars of color who have engaged with these topics um, in the past, but I think it's important um, for them to be explored further and that there's a lot to learn um, in these contexts. That's great. Well, perfect timing. I think I'm gonna turn it over to Laura, who's gonna close out our program. Laura? Well, um, I just have a couple of questions. Oh, One okay, uh, from Mason Miller. Oh, he fantastic. wanted to ask, um, were the cadaver dogs specially trained to locate human remains in archeological contexts? So cadaver dogs actually at the highest level of training, they're referred to as human remains detection dogs as well. And yes, they're trained to identify uh, buried human remains. They've actually been used on the California fire sites. Uh, they've been uh, uh, able to identify cremations in the burnt ruins of homes in California. So they have tremendous capabilities. Um, what, um, how much time do you usually give yourself to find next of kin. Um, and it sort of leads into a question that I have. Um, how likely are we to find any next of kin of Oakwood in Oakwood's individuals uh, through genomic analysis? Do you want to yeah. go ahead, Sam? Okay. Um, so I think that based on the history of how Black folks in Austin have um, been able to stick around to a certain extent, but now that they, as I mentioned in my presentation, as they're being pushed to areas like Pflugerville and to areas like Lockhart because of gentrification in East Austin, I think that it's possible, but I think that the further that people are being pushed out because of the growth of the city, that it might become increasingly more difficult. And also, um, we know that individuals were potentially just passing through the city and were buried in the location that they were buried because they were travelers. Um, so there is some indication that folks could have been established in the area and they simply were buried there because they didn't have the economic means to have um, a different kind of burial. But I think that um, there is something that significantly makes it more difficult because of the current um, sociopolitical climate of Austin specifically. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, that was a wonderful discussion. I am so indebted to all of you for participating. Um, it was really, really fascinating. And what a great close to our first day. Um, we want to invite everyone to come back tomorrow. Uh, we will reconvene at noon uh, for the second half of our uh, All Together Here Symposium, a com community symposium. Uh, in uh, the second half of the symposium, uh, we will explore the historic contexts of the burials um, yeah, there I am uh, of the burials, the historic context, um, the the ways we grave uh, methods of memorialization, and then um, public processes uh, seeking transparency and a model for um, uh, public entities involved in these kinds of discoveries. So thank you so, so very much for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you back here at noon tomorrow.